polka dots for me, living life so merrily. It's so easy, can't you see? Polka, polka dots for me. Polka, polka, everyone, come along, it's lots of fun. Welcome back to the Talk and Shoot podcast. I am host Miguel Adorati, joined by co-host Michael Davis, and we are Talk and Shoot. The uh, theme this week, uh, we're going to start doing a little more MMA themes on these blogs. Um, We've touched on a couple of the big uh, hot-button issues this year um, with regards to PEDs and uh, the Reebok deal and things like that, but we haven't really looked at the state of MMA in general as a sport, Uh, and maybe we should start doing that on a weekly basis. So I think this is a great week to start because June 20th, we got a couple, you know, June 19th and June 20th, we've got a couple of big shows going on with the big American companies, the UFC and Bellator. Uh, Bellator is in St. Louis with their big uh, uh, unfinished business card, as they're calling it, and uh, the UFC's uh, traveling road show is in Germany this week. And uh, both of those, you know, with the current uh, topic of, of performance-enhancing drugs and things, Um, I think we could start touching on that theme as it revolves around both of these shows because I think that there are a couple of questions I'd like to see answered. Uh, How you doing, Mike? Real good, man. Thanks. I mean, it's always a pleasure to knock one of these out. Um, There is a lot of interesting things happening in MMA lately. It's almost like it's at a fork in the road right now in terms of uh, what's going on behind the scenes and uh, the path that each organization is taking is... um, it's either going to get narrower or it's going to get wider. And that's kind of like what we're experiencing this weekend, in my opinion. I, I think so. I think we're going to we're going to be able to talk about some of the contrasts between Bellator and the UFC that are developing in 2005. And at the end of the day, I don't think, you know, the, some of those contrasts are going to be able to stand in terms of, um, you know, you're going to have to pick one path or the other, and that's specifically in terms of, of the PED pro. Let, 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 me, let me start. Let's start this off yeah, with the basics, true. Mike. You know, Bellator is uh, one of those companies that I think, um, you know, people have high hopes for. I think people want somebody to compete with the UFC. I think Coker, Scott Coker, their uh, president, is uh, the type of guy who's been around long enough that people are comfortable with him. And, uh, you know, he's sort of bland in terms of, you know, he has, he knows fights and he has his, his style of stuff, but he's sort of bland in terms of press conferences and that sort of stuff. He's by no means as controversial as Bjorn Redney was before that. And, you know, you can't compare him at all to Dana White. No. Um, so th- there's a lot um, uh, of questions around Bellator. Uh, uh, Coker's been there now for about a year, and I don't see any, any really positive changes and they seem to be getting a little bit of a buy with that on the, um, uh, you know, on the press side where people are still, you know, saying, oh, you know, Bellator's, uh, they have hope that things are going to get better and I don't see it. So let's talk about this unfinished business card. I mean, yeah, t- I, talk about, I, I, go ahead, Mike. First and foremost, I like Bellator. I like Bellator. Like, I really do. I enjoy it. I like it a lot. Um, you know, in my opinion, um, especially after the Ortiz, uh, Bonner fight. I know they had a ton of views on it. It was one of their their higher viewed events. Um, this seems to be the road that they want to go down. You know, with like uh, kind of retreads in terms of fighters that have been built in other organizations that are you know now headlining in theirs. Um, I tell you what, they've gotten away from though, which I think is a big mistake. Um, when Repu was there. It was like once a week, or once I shouldn't say once a week, probably every other week or every three weeks, they would highlight a clip of like something that had happened at one of their events. For instance, in Bellator 5, when uh, Toby Imeda, um was it inverted triangled uh, Masvidal, they would put these montages together of that fight and how it ended, and it was really done super cool, and it would go viral like on Facebook, and it seems that they have gotten away from that. Like, the, they're not real concerned about putting videos like that out anymore. You know, if they do, they don't pop up on my feed. You know, they should probably pay for them, you know, as an ad to pop up on social media. But it, it doesn't really seem to be a highlight anymore. It seems more, hey, we got Ken Shamrock. We got Kimbo Slice. It's the headline. And it's like they're ignoring the guys that are underneath them 
which essentially your company's built on. Yeah, I, look, Bellator's been around for a long time now, and they started out with a broken model. Rebney, you know, left the company. He was stubbornly sticking by the tournament format that uh, Coker, you know, stepped away from. But the real part of the broken format that Bellator has is not the, um, the, the tournament format that was there. It was the fact that they're married to a TV schedule. So they gotta produce yeah. a, they got to produce a weekly show, and then they have three months off, and it really becomes hard to work on a roster there. Um, to, to Redney's credit, I mean, you know, he was on again, off again. you got to give him credit for sticking by, you know, his way of doing things and stuff. But And, and there is some talent on this roster that, that comes back from those days, you know. Um, the featherweight division is pretty good. Um, Patricia Ferrer, um, there's Daniel Weichel is challenging him next. And they've got, uh, you know, Daniel Strauss, Pat Curran. Uh, it's a pretty good division at lightweight. And this is where, you know, Redney leaves and Coker steps in and nobody questions him. At lightweight, they also had a lot of talent. They got Will Brooks there. They got um, uh, Michael Chandler. And, uh, you know, there's some, there's some other good fighters in that division. They also had Eddie Alvarez, and they let Alvarez go. for basic, crazy. For basically nothing to the big show. And it just doesn't make any sense that uh, nobody would question that uh, in terms of what, what was the business motivation for that. Was it really to save money on Alvarez, who was your best fighter? Um... Was it to save money on Alvarez and pay for Tito Ortiz and Stephen Bonner? Because to me, that's an unbelievably, uh, you know, gimmicky uh, direction to go in and stepping away from being a true sport. And the fact of the matter is, yes, a lot of people watch Stephen Bonner and Tito Ortiz. But it, was the fight such that people are going to say, you know, that Bellator, I'm going to watch that again? I don't think so. I saw two old men fighting in there. It was slow. Um, there was no explosiveness at all about it. The uh, build-up to it with their embarrassing uh, promotion of bringing in Justin McCauley. Hey, and, hey, and, and, you know, hey, that was awesome. Hey, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I could see the other person saying that that was awesome is Dana White. Right. You know, no, they, no, right. they, I would have, if I were Dana, I would have, I would have, res- if I were Dana, I would have said, reserved a boardroom in, in the UFC offices uh, and invited the entire staff to come and watch that so that we could all enjoy it together because it was high buffoonery. Again, and whose fault is that? That's the promoter's fault. That's, that's Scott Coker uh, I, making I, another hideous decision. I agree. I, you, can't, you, can't, you can't disagree with that. You know, and on top of that, Miguel, like, for instance, when you have a former training partner of a guy come out with a mask and you're announcing, well, he's my training partner for this event, at least clue the announcers in on it. They, you know, they had no prep it's at like all. This big surprise, and the announcers are pretty much like, "Oh my God, look at this!" And they're like, "Who is this guy?" Yeah, who you is? Know, give them some background. You know, you know wh- let them sell it being cool, which, in all honesty, um, could have been cool, but it it, it was know, it was it, it just seemed canned. Way. It didn't seem natural. You could find rivalries like that that are natural, but um. This one seemed canned, and it was funny because I, you know, going back in the old days of MMA, um, I, I, I've met Tito many times. He came to some of our shows in Indiana, and he used to come in with Tiki Gosen. When they took the mask off, even I was sitting in the ring, I was like, wow, Tiki got fat, you know, <laughs> because <laughs> you know, I was confused as well, you know. And then obviously uh, I put it together, but God... I, that was one of the most embarrassing things. Again, uh, no one it questions what, what Coker it's was... A, yeah, it took me a minute to put it together as well. I'm like, man, who is that guy? Let me go through my Rolodex in my head. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, man. Because it's not like, you know, it's not like McCulley was ever, you know, was ever anybody really relevant, you know, no. uh, in, in no. MMA. I mean, him and his brother go back a long, long time, and, and Sean participated in... You know, bare knuckle fights and pancreas in Japan and, and and stuff like that. But you know, that's twenty years ago, and hey, I remember you know, Sean more than than Justin. You know. Hey, when Tiki visited you, did he have like a tiger striped uh, goatee? Uh, on one of the occasions, I believe he did. Yes. Oh my god. Um. Anyway, but but let's say let's stick in let's stick with this. So we're going through this. So now Bellator. Um, with this Tito Ortiz and Stephen Bonner fight that you know they, they're so proud of and they got many eyes, I didn't hear anybody say that was a great fight. Nobody said that was a great fight. And at the end of the day, 
I think Eddie Alvarez would get you great fights more than, you know, somebody who's going to put your product out there and people are going to say, eh, you know, which is exactly what happened and which is what I predict is going to happen this weekend. Let's talk about unfinished business. Uh, on the 19th of June, this Friday, they're, they're coming in to St. Louis with this uh, pay-per-view or pay-per-view level show, I guess they think. Um, and uh, it's headlined by Kimbo Slice versus Ken Shamrock. Mike, take it away. Well, uh, this is obviously one of those matches that's going to settle the pound-for-pound greatest dangerous man of all time. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. You know what? I mean, you're never supposed to disrespect, you know, uh, the older guys. You're not. You know, both of us really enjoy the history of it as well as, you know, respect people for what they've done. This fight is a gimmick bout, and I'm not going to say the UFC isn't above it either, you know, with them bringing on CM Punk, um, having never fought before, but there's a lot of different things that, that you know, from the outside perspective that you kind of look in at, and the first is this whole drug testing, you know, that's going on. And Shamrock is an admitted, admitted PED user. He's saying the right things around this fight, but I mean... Uh, you know, yeah, look, look at what he looks like, and if you apply just an eye test and what you see and what you think, you know, he looks pretty good at 51 years old. Um, it, it also, to me, uh, is, is interesting how ha this fight happens to be scheduled for St. Louis, Missouri, where um, the Missouri State Boxing Commission will be overseeing it. Now, um, Mike, I'll let you talk a little bit about Midwest commissions and what you know of Missouri. Well, all right. There's a couple things. Is Shamrock trustworthy to actually go through with this? Now, the last time he was supposed to fight Kimbo, um, he got a cut in the locker room. In the locker room prior to stepping out of there, where Seth Putricelli took his spot. Do right. Do you recall that? Yeah, absolutely. And now, uh, that also, you know, pretty much, that was Strike Force. That was the Strike Force. What, what organization was that? That was Elite XC. Elite XC, that also was the end of that promotion when that happened. I mean, they were essentially built on Shamrock. <clears throat> so you've always got a question mark with Ken, what he's up to. You know, there was rumors that he was holding up the organization for more money in the locker room. There was other rumors saying that he was on the payroll of a different organization. It got paid to do that. I mean, it was just, there were so many things swirling around that um, you didn't know what was going on left or right. And based on Shamrock's history... Um, all of which were kind of believable. You just had to figure out which conspiracy theory that you know you wanted to buy into. Now we're talking about the commission. Missouri Commission has some really good people working for it. I've never had the pleasure of dealing with them. I've dealt with Illinois as well as uh, Indiana. I have to assume they're somewhat similar to Indiana in regards to their overall staffing, which is bare bones. And as an organization, when you go, well, here we go. I got Kimbo Slice and I got Ken Shamrock. Where are we going to put this thing? It's going to be a decent draw. St. Louis has got to be so far down that list that it's almost intentional that it's there. Yeah, Kimbo. Kimbo's not from St. Louis. He's from Florida, and Ken's in you know California. California. So, you know, both of those states have a more robust commission that maybe could handle drug testing. Missouri... The Bellator, because they do not have a policy like the UFC, and we'll head into that uh, here in this conversation, um, because they don't, they will defer to the local boxing commission, and the local boxing commission will apply whatever testing is they're capable of. Now, I've done some research, and Missouri in 2015 has run roughly 20 to 25 boxing events, and, okay. and roughly 35 to 40 MMA events in the state of Missouri. Most of them. Are professional. These are professional events. Yeah, these are both professional and amateur, as far as what they list on their website results at, at the commissions. Um, the the point is, is that none of them are, are, let's say, like a UFC event or Mayweather, Pacquiao, or anything like that. So um, I'm estimating that the income of the Missouri State Commission from those events is not going to be enough to do a full uh, UFC level drug testing on anybody um, on this unfinished business card. So I think Bellator is dodging a bullet by, you know, saying, hey, the commissions are in charge and the commissions are going to do what they can do. But at the end of the day, um, some of the, this uh, 
evasion gets so scientific that the basic rudimentary tests that Missouri is going to be able to do are going to be useless. I think that's a smart move on Coker's part. You know, based on the two people that are main eventing, I think that's that's probably his best bet. And really uh, pull his and, off. And I wonder if that went into the thinking of it because, uh, you know, in terms of, like you said, a, a draw or a hometown crowd or something, it doesn't make a lot of sense, I mean, um, uh, to put this fight in St. Louis. Um Let's get further down into the card. Now, there's some good fights on the card. Um, like uh, we, we mentioned that they had some good competition. You've got our uh, Daniel uh, Daniel Strauss returning to the ring, facing the undefeated fighter Henry Corrales. Strauss, a former champion, looking to work his way back in. you got uh, featherweight champion Patricio Ferrer uh, making a, a title defense against Daniel Weichel. Weichel broke through uh, in his last fight. Uh, had a nice outing, um, big veteran from Germany with a lot of fights, and uh, he's coming through in, in this title fight. And they've also got um, uh, Michael Chandler on this card. Michael Chandler is a former lightweight champion, and uh, he's lost three fights in a row, three very hard fights. Uh, quite honestly, very um, Chandler's entertaining to watch fights. So they're, they're like highlight real fights that you get uh, from him. And, and he's fighting a tough kid named Derek Campos. Now, that's your main card, and there's three solid fights. So most of those guys, um, you know, I guess you give Coker credit for keeping that on the card and, and not discarding all these guys. But Chandler, one of his losses was to Eddie Alvarez, who we mentioned is no longer on the roster. Um, there are no welterweights here. Um, the welterweights will headline a, a show coming up. But uh, they also had let Ben Askren go. Wally held their title. So they, they let, that was Redney, not Kyle Coker. But there's just a history of letting guys go in this company um, that are the top competitors they have and, and switching over to these gimmicks. Now, speaking of gimmicks, this card also has Bobby Lashley on the card. <laughs> and, you know, this to me is really a situation where um, Bobby Lashley is just a bad joke at this point. He's 41 years old. Um, he's an actor because... Is he a draw? Like, is he... Like, I know these guys do, like, some sort of algorithm to where they kind of understand what a fighter is worth. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Lashley's worth about 19 cents. I can tell you yeah, that. But, but he's getting paid top dollar. I, look, here's the thing. He's a pro wrestler. That's why I say he's an actor and he's... he's uh, in TNA wrestling. He was in WWE wrestling where once you're in WWE, it's like being in the UFC, you become a, a person who's known. You're just known. Um, and he has that residual thing. Now, he left the WWE amid some rumors of... You know, I'll let you get into, to, into some of that stuff, but amid some rumors of, of you know positive drug tests or positive hepatitis tests and, yeah. and, and stuff along that, those lines. So... The WWE cut ties with him. Is he um, a poster boy type of guy? Like, you could, you know, if you feature him on a poster, his body type and stuff like that, he looks like a fighter, he looks like a million bucks, you know? Again, that hints at maybe potential steroid use, only because to me, um, you know, part of, the, part of pro wrestling is the look. Now, this is where Bobby Lashley comes crashing down. So he left the WWE, he didn't leave under, you know, a high note, so to speak. Um... And then Brock Lesnar comes over and he starts He's doing MMA. Going back there. Like they're, not, they're, they're never going to take him back. Hey, you know, it doesn't look that way. I, I haven't really, you know, kept tune of, of, of that era, uh, aspect of the business, but I don't think they need him for anything. Um, you know, it just depends on, on picking spots and stuff, but there are a million guys that they could bring in. They've got um, a real good roster in, in NXT that's making its way to the bay. They have no need for Bobby Lashley anymore. And Lashley's with TNA. And now, this is a, getting back to Brock Lesnar. So you've got Lesnar, who's also in WWE, um, and he's a huge draw. And he's proven that he's a huge draw. He came to UFC. Athlete at and, every level. and like Lashley, a phenomenal athlete, comes over to UFC. And at the end of the day, if you, you can criticize Lesnar or, or say whatever you want. At the end of the day, the guy got into the ring with Frank Mir and Randy Couture, and that sort of fighter. So it's not like you can say because Lashley's record of 12-2 and two has nothing in terms of competition. Um, they're all build-up fights. Super padded. 
Yeah, they are all build-up fights, and it's like, what are they waiting for? And here's the other part. Is, so Lesnar's a proven draw. Lashley's not a proven draw. Um, TNA, where he wrestles, is uh, bouncing around networks. And, um, you know, they went from Spike TV, where they actually had a relationship with Bellator. They went from Spike TV and, uh, onto Destination America. Um and the rumors are hitting the mills that Destination America is not happy with the numbers that they're getting from the product. They're investing a lot, and there are some very good wrestlers there, but Lashley is not a draw that, you know, if Lesnar was there, he might be saving the company. Lashley's already been around 10, 15 years. It's proven he can't do that. And um, here's the other part is... I mean, a quick Google search for Bobby Lashley will tell you that there's a lot of baggage attached to him. Like, a lot of baggage. And... Um, like I said, if it's coming up on Google and in your regular search engines, you can only imagine like what the reality of the situation is. And Lashley is, he's one of those guys that, I mean, I hate to say this about anybody, he's one of those guys that seems like he's really pushed his body as far as he can, like to the extreme on every single level. And, you know, guys like that don't live to 100. Yeah, here's the other thing, too, is now he's proven to not be a draw in, in either sport or, you know, in wrestling or in MMA because he's just a big name that sucks up a big check. And, you know, we're questioning a little bit of Scott Coker's work at, uh, you know, work at Bellator here. And he's been bringing Lashley along since the strike Why? force days. Why? And it just doesn't make any sense at all. But uh, there he is, and Lashley, you know, will probably be tested for hepatitis in um, in St. Louis. At least that will be done. Or, or provide blood work, you know, stating that he doesn't have it. But Yeah, I, I mean... Know a, I know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to say specifics, but I know there's a couple lawsuits um, against organizations uh, involving fighters that have fought Lashley in the past. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but I've heard from incredibly reliable sources... And like Bobby Lashley has got me. There's a lot of flags with fighters that are well known, and they say, "No, I ain't fighting them. No way. Too risky." Now, why, why Coker is in bed with this guy to a certain degree? You know, to this degree is is like mind boggling. It's either he's lazy, or Lashley's there. I mean, what's he gonna do? Continue building them and then push him in a really hard in one fight, and you know we're gonna get one good main event out of him. Like I, I would understand that type of theory, but I don't see it happening with Lashley. Like his last few fights have been so bad that you know people like internet forums blew up with, "Oh my God, why him again?" Yeah, he is. You, know, he, I might mean, as, you might as well bring, bring back Charles Crazy Horse Bennett. He's, he actually was entertaining. Yeah, and Bennett, Bennett at least fought. You know, Lashley, yeah, Lashley fun. seems petrified to fight. Uh, he, he's a lay and pray fighter, nothing more. Um, he's been doing it at a. a, a, a a really low level. I really hope this Dan Charles he's facing this weekend uh, is a good fighter. He's nine and two. He looks to have a decent resume um, in terms of he's been fighting on Roland Saria's shows uh, down in the Southwest, the Rage in the Cage series. That's been around forever. I don't know honestly where the level of fighters are currently in the Rage in the Cage in South, but I imagine you know they always had a, a, a presentable. Level so Charles may be one, maybe the toughest opponent he's ever faced, but he's in his 15th fight. So Lashley's complete garbage, and that's what Bellator wants uh, to put in front of TV. Now, of course, it's gonna have eyes, it's on free TV, people are gonna watch it. But again, in the long term health of your product, the that fight is gonna go on, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Lashley fight's gonna be ugly, and the Shamrock Kimbo slice. Um, fight is a formula for disaster in the ring where, you know, even if they get in there, so, you know, a hamstring pops and you, you're out of the fight in 30 seconds. Somebody gets cut, something stupid can easily happen, and you bank, you put all your eggs in that basket. So um, it's in a place where there won't be the drug testing. It's, that, a, it's, it's insane. Yeah, it's insane to me. I, I just I can't imagine. I, I don't know. So, We've already said it. So now, so now let's get over to the UFC. The UFC is in Germany this week, um, and they've got a main of, and they've got a main event. But th this brings me uh, up a lot of questions here. This uh, the UFC's drug policy. When 
when it first hit, when they made their press conferences, that still that press conference was taped, but is still not being allowed to be shown and things like that. So uh, there's still a lot of open questions. The, the preliminary numbers, the first number I saw in the media for a cost for the UFC uh, on an annual basis for their drug testing is about $30 million. Um, that's that's that, that was, mind-boggling. That was a number that... Um, was presented to Fertitta in uh, the piece I was reading, and Lorenzo Fertitta kind of chafed at that number. It is a high number. Um, really, though, the numbers that we also heard about, you know, 2,700 and something drug tests divided by 600 fighters, you got about four, uh, four tests a year. That's just a random testing. What goes on with the uh, testing around the fights? Because in Germany, I don't believe that you've got a, a, a great uh, formula there. I don't believe that anywhere in Europe that the boxing commissions are also administering MMA. That goes for England, uh, where the British Boxing Board of Control does not touch MMA, and MMA is an unregulated sport. Um, what are the regulations in Germany? That means there are, you know, the uh, German Boxing Association, they go by Bund, you know, something in German. I'm not even going to try it, but I do know a lot about how they work. Um, and they do basically minimal drug testing. You know, they do in-fight drug testing, but there's no random testing, um, and there's no high-level water testing where they're testing, you know, for a, a wide range of substances there. So who's going to administer the fight testing um, uh, to these, the, around this fight in Germany? Um, interestingly, also, the UFC, this is, I think, one of the first UFCs I can recall where top to bottom, every single fighter, there's not a single fighter from the United States. And I find that interesting. I mean, it means they have a nice deep roster and they have achieved international acclaim, but um, are these fighters all undergoing, uh, you know, random testing at home? Um, you know, you've got a couple of Polish fighters. Are you going to Poland to test them? Anyway, yeah. let's get into that. Well, I, I, I mean, you're talking about some of the higher end. European countries, or you know, European countries, I should say. What about the guys in Kazakhstan? Sure. You know? I think here's here's the big question is, and I've been to Russia on several occasions. Miguel, you took me to Russia with you. I, we've Absolutely. been we've been to Russia together, and I can tell you this: in you know, in Moscow and St. Petersburg, it's tough, and that's not Kazakhstan, man. The in Kazakhstan, it gets tougher, and it's a different culture. Um, and you are an outsider. In, in addition to that, with the Russians and the kind of, you know these fighters and stuff, the UFC's never done a show there. I mean, they may pull one off here soon, but they're going to pay a lot of money for it. They, they do. Do they even have partners there? So they're going into territory where, at least in Poland, they might have a structure around the people that help them put on the shows and things like that. Um, in, in Brazil, that worked against them recently. Um, having a commission there and somebody that they were familiar with. But going into Russia, you're going into, you know, completely uncharted territory. And in terms of just world politics, you know, Russians are contrary to the Americans right now. You know, their their planes are buzzing on warships and stuff, and they're just kind of being, you know, contrary to everything we do. Why would you expect to be able to go there and get any cooperation? So it is, it is tough. This card has several Germans on it, Polish fighters. There are Russian fighters. There are British fighters. Expect you'll get a high level of cooperation from them. But once you get down into the lower part of the card, I'm starting to look at guys that are probably going to make you know ten or twelve thousand uh, bucks for their fight. You know, and uh, how much hassle are you going to put these guys through? How much are you going to put into going? You know. A, a, into drug testing, like you said, into some of these deeper, darker places, Mike. Mike, go ahead and... and yeah, I mean, I, I, I imagine, Miguel, once this drug testing takes effect and it's kind of uh, you know, full steam ahead, you imagine that there's like probably a chalkboard where they got different fighters' names and where they're from, where everyone's looking at each other going, yeah, you know, that's certainly not my first choice. And... Um, they're probably going to be drawing names out of a bag in regards to who has to go where. Um, when you took me to Russia, Miguel, you know, to help with an MMA fight, you saw a first world country there. But when the slide of hand happened, it, it essentially told you that the value of life 
life in Russia is nowhere near as it is in many other parts of the world. So when you're going into Croatia, you're going into Kazakhstan or countries of that nature, it's you need to be very, very careful on how you tread when you get there. Absolutely. And how you present yourself. Absolutely. It's a different culture and they have answer to a different power structure, you know? So it's like they answer to other you know, other people make decisions and stuff. I'll give you one good example. Uh, I was there with a team of fighters. I think Dave Strasser was one of them, and uh, we were going. We went to the arena to fight, and uh, we're being shown the locker rooms and stuff. And I walk into the locker room, and uh, you know, there's a table with some water and a little bit of food and chairs and, and all kinds of things. It's an old hockey stadium where we fought. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's the Lujaniki, which is still in use. Um, <laughs> it, it, I'm trying to recall, but anyway, it was an old soccer stadium, and you know, someone comes in and goes, "Okay, no, sorry, this this is the Russians' locker room. Yours is over there." And we went to another locker room, and there wasn't anything. It was a cement room. There wasn't a table. There wasn't water. There wasn't any chairs, slabs of cement to sit on, and that was it. And that was. Um, uh, you know, one of the things where it's like, oh, okay, I guess they forgot or the catering service forgot our stuff or whatever. We actually were saved by a, a team of guys from Spain um, to give a shout out to Alejandro Iglesias out there, an old friend of mine. But uh, he had fought in Russia or he had taken people to fight in Russia before and he had with him a giant cooler that kind of took care of the foreign fighters. He had enough water for everybody and apples and, you know, things like that. So, uh, it, you kind of got to know how to take care of yourself over there. And there's just one uh, example, and that, that's a good show. That show was actually run by um, Vadim Finkelstein, who is uh, Fedor Emelianenko's manager, manager and, yeah. and part of the powers behind M1, which is still a long-running show, you know, that's not the UFC out there. But uh, it's an, it makes it tough for the UFC. But now let's get, let's get back to this. Um, I did find that uh, they, there is a kid from California on the undercard, here at the UFC, um, a, a kid named Lahat, Noad Lahat, is uh, from San Jose, California. The name makes me think he, he could possibly, you know, have some ties to Europe as well uh, anyway. But um, uh, he's on there, so it's not fair to say that there, there's not a single American on there. But anyway. He would be a transplant, though, based on his name. You yeah, know. Maybe, you know, perhaps. But let's get back to this thing here. So now we're talking about the UFC, and the UFC may be absorbing a $30 million annual bill on drug testing. We're talking about how the logistics are going to make it really hard, and I predict that that bill that they will find thirty million dollars will not be enough to get everything done. But they can afford it. Now, Bellator is going to have. They've ignored this, and as you said, you know, as a promoter, you know, to a certain point, just ignore what the UFC is doing. Boxing is ignoring all that as well. They should. Um, and and you know, if they're going to keep operating the way they they do. Um, then obviously they're going to keep ignoring it. But to be Bellator, now they're in St. Louis with a couple of guys that are, are questionable, you know, admitted steroid use uh, on the part of Ken Shamrock as well. And they're in a place with very limited testing. Um, the, you know, the big thing about Bellator is Bellator is the number two company. They are backed by a, a media conglomerate called Viacom, right? Sure. Viacom's got deep pockets, and they could afford a $30 million bill. But... This is where you get into a little bit of the different things. At the end of the day, you know, White, Fertitta, you can criticize them uh, for business practices. You can claim whatever you want, but they have a passion for their UFC product and the fights. And, and therefore, that's where somebody is going to accept taking that bill, at least for a period of time. To me, the interesting thing is, is once you get to Viacom, now you're dealing with executives. and Now you're dealing with... The bottom line, I can't see, you know, they've left the business direction or, or the direction of the actual fight in ring product, in, in cage product to Coker and Coker's done a bad job. So I can't believe that they're sitting around, you know, making piles of money the way the UFC is, um, you know, running these shows in Thackerville, Oklahoma and, and, and the like, you know. So they're probably not getting the bang for the buck. Um, for you know, for their money um, and for their investments. So now, what happens is, if, if Coker were you know looking to be a real sport and looking to stay with the competition, Coker should be putting forth a bill to the Viacom people 
for the full drug testing, just like the UFC is doing, and that avoids every and you know any other question. If he does not do that, which he won't, as you would say, if he does not do that, now you're on a real interesting future path for the sport of MMA. Mike, what do you think? Well, I think this UFC drug policy has got it does not have legs. I think it's temporary. There's no way this thing is going to be going on from here on uh, here on out. There's no way, and it's just too expensive. It's it, it, I'd say it appears that they are doing this in order to either lure huge sponsors in, like Reebok, which, as far as I'm, as we had discussed, you know, in, in an earlier podcast, really got a bargain in regards to you know the money they paid, you know, to to dress the UFC fighters. This this seems like a sleight of hand move, and I do not believe it's permanent. Maybe they do it for a year, and they say, you know what, no one failed. It's fantastic. We don't need to do this anymore. You know, one of those just kind of announcements to where, yes, it's way too expensive, but we don't want to say that. This has got to go. I just I I think you may be right. I think it could last longer than a year, and I think you know, in terms of a, a, a overall strategy where the UFC. Kind of launches things and it lets them kill off the competition. This could be the end of Bellator only because of the following reasons. It's the age-old argument that we've always had um, uh, in MMA about the steroids. It comes down to one thing. Are you going to let the fighters use it or not? Okay? Now, that's the moral question that we must answer. Because the bottom line is right now the rule is that we are not going to allow them to use it. But we're in this world of farce because you can't enforce it. You can't enforce it. People fail when you are in there. And how many other people are actually on stuff that you're not catching because you cannot enforce it? The commission structure is broken. The commissioners cannot handle it. Nevada is going to take care of themselves because they've got money. California will keep up. New York and Florida will keep up. But as far as small commissions and stuff... None of them can drug test, and then, then you get an atmosphere where, like, you know, Bellator can go to St. Louis, run a show with questionable um, steroid use and talent, um, and, and, and just p- put it on the commission, whereas the commission cannot perform the testing that the UFC or the Nevada State Commission is doing. Um, at the end of the day, I think that works against Bellator, and the UFC could keep their policy even until the point where, you know, Bellator goes away. The Viacom people would look at a $30 million bill and they would say, look, we're talking about the bottom line here and the bottom line is is that I cannot absorb that bill. And that's what the UFC could use to kill Bellator is the fact is let Bellator not drug test, let them continue to use questionable athletes. There is going to, there's a pregnancy in the air about um, the PED issue. Now keep in mind um, right now, the law is that you cannot do it, and there are people that enforce this stuff. And when you start breaking the rules and looking lax on a world level, um, there are entities and uh, you know uh, organizations that will chase you down eventually. And nobody's sacred. And the UFC, I think, realizes that, and that's why they've instituted this policy. I'm talking about things like. You know, Lance Armstrong went down hard. And at the end of the day, what did he do? He took steroids and rode a bicycle. But through his lies denying steroid use, he raised hundreds of millions of dollars for cancer research with his little, you know, Be Strong or whatever the campaign was and stuff. And, you know, I don't know that, you know, that isn't something that he was being beneficial uh, for it, uh, you know, for life and stuff. So, But even with those positives... Somebody took him down. Baseball has been decimated by this stuff. The FBI, you know, lists of hundreds of players that used and, you know, chasing around doctors and organizations and, and, and uh, labs opening up to provide players with, um, you know, uh, engineered steroids that are not uh, technically illegal anymore and stuff like that. And all of that stuff, they went down. So what did the UFC do is they preemptively, because this is what I think is going to happen in, in the, the MMA at some point and boxing, is they are going to feel a huge pressure like that of like, look, this is illegal. You guys are, turn, are passing the buck around. 
The boxing commissions can't handle all the stress. The promoters are just washing their hands out of it and in general not doing anything. And steroid use is rampant and they will take the whole thing down, possibly to institute some type of national authority uh, uh, to regulate the sports as opposed to the 50 boxing commissions and then there's boxing commissions on Indian territory and blah, 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 where none of the uh, drug testing is going to get done. So unless... It's gotten to the point where that's what's going to happen. Something like a Lance Armstrong or like a baseball scandal is going to hit this combat sports um, because someone's going to build up to do that. And guess who the only people protected against that right now are? The UFC. Well, you also have to assume that they're going to be using this as leverage. Like leverage in terms of you know, sponsors. And I'm not just saying new sponsors. They're also going to be approaching Bellator sponsors. And they're going to be hammering them and hammering them. You know, look what you're associated with. This is what we're doing. This is what you got going. You know, if they can swing Bellator sponsors over a couple of their anchor sponsors, I'll tell you what, they got problems. I mean, I've been a couple of Bellator live shows, you know, maybe like three or four of them. They're not really well attended. That, that company, there's no way that company's making money. About four years ago, I went head up with them, like, 30 miles away from each other, no, about 25 miles away from each other, I outdrew Bellator. So, it, it, I don't know. There's some sleight of hand going on here, and as we discussed at the beginning of this podcast, you know, we're going to figure out why and how, you know, and where it's going to go. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, it was an interesting week to do our first State of MMA podcast because you got Bellator there. Well, I'll tell you, here, you know, one of the things that we're not talking about, go to UFC.com and go look at the prelim fighters on this, this Saturday's card. Now, we all know that there's a huge staff for the UFC. When you go to UFC.com, you got silhouettes of fighters uh, as, that are fighting on their, their preliminary card. Like, they don't even have the fighter photo up there. You know, as a promoter, you know, regionally, I understand it's difficult. But once you make your way to the UFC, you have to assume that you kind of got all, you know, the stars have aligned themselves. You've got a, a direct line to the UFC. You know, sending a picture in for them to use on their website, you know, is probably on the, you know, easy end of the spectrum in regards to your overall ability. Yeah, no, they, the UFC is handling a massive roster, and that's why it'll be interesting to see what percentage of people get busted, especially because they don't have a lot of control over the lower level of the fighters, you know. These guys are trying to find an edge. They're not making a lot of money in the UFC. Um, they're making less money off the sponsors. And uh, it's interesting about the pictures because the bottom line is this. is Yeah, they, they hit you with a corporation, the UFC does. And the bottom line is this. is It's Wednesday afternoon in Germany. All the fighters should be in Germany. Have, have a staffer go take a headshot of this guy. You know what I mean? He's in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that's nuts. You know. So yeah, they're they're but but they are really at this point by circling the wagons, um, defending themselves very well. They're the big corporation. They have the biggest roster, the best fighters, and uh, you know they're doing a show in Germany. At the end of the day, their strategy. They've been in Germany, Poland. They've done shows in the Philippines, Australia. They're working on shows in, in England, where you know they've been a presence in England for a long time. But England around a new core of fighters, like the Irish guys that are in there, and and stuff like that. So I mean, their business model is working. I I, I don't know what Bellator is doing with their business model. Um, however, we get Bellator's signature show well, yeah. this weekend. You know, I you know what they're doing. Yeah, I want I want to see. We're in St. Louis with Shamrock versus Kimbo Slice. Yeah, it, it's it's freaking it's it's apples and oranges at this point. With and Bobby Lashley on the undercard, you know, it, the huge draw. No, 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 he's, he's on the main card. He's on the main card, buddy. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he 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 will be featured on the Spike TV broadcast. That's the embarrassing part. Um, look, I think we've done a good job. I want to wrap it up here. I think we've done a good job, basically. Um, Asking some questions about where we are in MMA today. Um, this around this weekend, uh, we've got Bellator 138, unfinished business, Shamrock and Kimbo Slice, and uh, you've got the UFC in Germany headlined by the uh, ladies' strawweight fight, Joanna Jedrzejczyk uh, taking on Je Jessica Penny. And um, yeah, I, I don't have UFC Fight Pass, but I will be watching MMA this weekend. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, I, I, there's this morbid like sense of me needing to watch this Kimbo Slice fight. I'll be watching. Yeah, no, I, you know, at the end of the day, if that's what Viacom cares about, that they can look and say, look, we got 1.2 here, go to advertising and stuff. But I'm telling you, over the long haul, you keep putting a, a, a yeah. B class product on there, and you're going to be B class forever. And yeah, not a good um, you know, people are going to watch. People are going to watch this stuff. But are people going to come back when, you know, Shamrock is, is you know, and what if you get a disaster in the ring, which is a, a higher percentage, which is, you know, Shamrock's bicep gets cut, you know, or, or, or gets loose, and, and you got an arm injury stopping the fight a minute in. Um, crazy. You know, I mean, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't want to jinx the guy, but... And, and you're right. I do respect Ken for what he's doing and stuff. I just think that as a promoter, if you want to take yourself seriously, you do also have to put this uh, type of thing in the proper place. And I don't know that as the headline show of a, of, of a company that wants to compete with the UFC and wants to call themselves a sport, that they should be doing that. You know? Uh, well... When Muhammad Ali fought his last few fights, I mean, there, there's an ESPN 30 for 30 right now about just how he should not have gotten in there. And, you know, there was a million different reasons and things going on in regards to his health and, and what's, what was happening with him mentally at the time. And, you know what, this is where Sham Rock's at. It's almost like you want to show respect by watching him, but you also think, like, you're doing him a disservice by doing so because he shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, I, I, I think yeah, I think that's got a, a good amount of points on there. I mean, like I said, Ken, he's physically okay. I mean, I, look, I, there's a fighter in Indiana uh, who was as hardworking and as humble as a nice a guy as you could ever meet. Um, and that was a kid named Mark Birch. And Birch uh, got signed to go to the UFC. Oh, that, that guy was tough. Yeah, they, great they, guy. They, they, you know, I don't think he would have been at a high level, but he was a heavyweight, and he, he came in the bang, and it was his dream. You know, he worked hard. He, he was an older guy that got to the UFC uh, level by working on smaller shows, and um, his fight was canceled because apparently fighters past a certain age must pass a different battery of tests. Um, you, you, people can look that up and stuff, but that happened. Birch's opportunity to be in the UFC was taken away from because they didn't have all the testing done um, for someone of his age. Now, Shamrock is well beyond that age. And, you know, technically it falls on the commission to tell him that he's not eligible to fight and uh, that he's not going to be given a license. Once he's given a license, and th this is what Bellator has now, is they have, well, you got a license, you know. So this whole system of the commissions and stuff is broken because, again, what what is the standard that... Missouri is going to hold Ken Shamrock to. What, what is the pre-fight drug testing? What is the pre-fight um, medical testing? You know, just straight medical tests. What are they doing uh, with that stuff in, in, in Missouri? It's all an open question. So anyway, let me wrap up here. But I think we've done a good job looking at MMA and look at, at the state of MMA from a different perspective. It's not just show to show anymore. You know, there's a, a, a history of uh, of things that are going to be happening here and this was a good week to start this podcast because you got Bellator and you got the UFC and we've been able to highlight right now differences between the two companies that exist that didn't exist six months ago I agree I agree it's kind of an exciting time Mike I want to thank you for joining us we're going to check in next week Bellator is back they're doing back-to-back uh, -back shows next weekend as well and obviously the UFC train is always rolling. So we'll check in next week and do another one of these and see what we got there. I do believe the uh, Bellator 139 card is a little more uh, is a little more uh, fighter friendly or, or fight sport friendly. But uh, we'll get into that next week. Mike, um, good. Take care, buddy. signing off here is Miguel Arati for Mike Davis. And this was been Talk and Shoot Podcasts MMA Roundup. And uh, we've been Talk and Shoot. See ya.